Thank you very much, Ejaku Nimo, and uh, your band. Ladies and gentlemen, the provost under whom the college organizes this biennial conference is ready to address us. Shall we please applaud Professor Christian Ejari for his address? Good morning, everyone. Chairman, with your permission, I have to go through the protocols because we invited them. So we have to acknowledge them. The chairman of this August conference, Professor Peter Donko, the pro vice chancellor, registrar, keynote speaker, and Asante Regional. Director of Ghana Health Service, Dr. Emmanuel Tenkrein, representative of the Asante Regional Minister, Honorable Simon Asay Mensa, CEO, National Health Insurance Authority, ably represented by the Deputy CEO, Finance and Investment, Mr. Francis Owusu, CEO, Confanochi Teaching Hospital, Member of Parliament for Euphoric Room Constituency, MC Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly, MC Euphoric Room Municipal Assembly, all speakers of this conference, all provosts present, college registrars, deans and directors, heads of departments, president of Ghana Medical Association. Acting Registrar, Allied Health Professions Council, President of Ghana Association of Biomedical Scientists, President of Ghana Veterinary Medical Association, Representative of the CEO of Food and Drug Authority, Representative of the Director General of Ghana Standards Authority, Representative of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana, Representative of Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association, Presidents, Rectors, and Registrars of Professional Bodies present, Principals and Tutors of Health Training Institutions, all invited guests, media personalities present, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure once again to warmly welcome you all to the 10th Biennial Scientific Conference of the College of Health Sciences, KNUST. This conference has become one of the most cherished traditions of the college, and it aims at bringing health professionals and scientists together to disseminate research findings and exchange ideas and information. Over the years, the conference has also provided a social platform where researchers can expand their networks and initiate discussions with their peers. This conference also serves as an effective tool for enhancing the vision and mission of the College of Health Sciences, KNUSC. This year's conference under the theme Promoting Healthy Lives and Wellbeing is most appropriate for the time that we found ourselves in. The stress of work coupled with our mandatory weekend social and family engagement is costing us a lot of our health and well-being without we realizing it. It is time to maintain a work-life balance and make our well-being our top priority. Research indicates that staying physically active can help prevent and delay a number of diseases, including some cancers, cardiovascular diseases, and diabetes. It, it, it is also relieves depression and improves our general mood. But the question is, how many of us undertake regular exercise? I believe you, you all agree with me that exercise is one of the unpleasant chores in our 
busy schedules often do not allow us time to consider this at all. Like exercise, a healthy diet we are fully aware is essential for good health and nutrition. It also protects us from a host of non-communicable diseases. As health professionals, some of us are so oblivious of what constitutes a healthy diet. And even if we know, healthy diets do not usually align with our taste buds. So often, we, ch we choose to go to the unhealthy way. As William Shakespeare said in his novel, Othello, and I quote, our bodies are our gardens, and to which our walls are the gardeners, unquote. A healthy life, as we all know, lives in a healthy body, and without good health, nothing meaningful can be achieved. It is on this basis that this conference has put together seasoned resource persons to give us this needed insight and information and also share the experiences with us. Again, the theme and the sub-themes selected directly address Sustainable Development Goal 3, which emphasizes on ensuring good health and promoting well-being for all ages. As a college, our core mandate is to train and promote human resources for healthcare delivery, engage in extension services within and outside Ghana, and undertake research to address important health issues. This conference offers another platform for us to achieve this mandate and use this medium for relevant discussions and brainstorming for national development. It is my hope that we will all have insightful discussions that will help promote attitudinal change for healthy lives and well-being towards the attainment of all human endeavors. On behalf of the management of the university and that of the college, I welcome you all once again to this conference. Please enjoy every bit of it and live here with a firm resolve to put your health before all other things and demands. Let me use this opportunity to thank and appreciate the chairman and then the members of the conference planning committee for their excellent and efficient organization of this conference. I know a lot of time and effort have gone into it, and I'm very, very grateful. Thank you all for choosing this to be part of this two-day journey as we discuss healthy lives and well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Provost. A better round of applause for the Provost, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, on the basis of the Provost stressing on healthy lifestyle, I want to let you know that this year's conference uh, intends to live on the theme. So tomorrow, we'll dress sporty and engage in exercises in tomorrow's activities. So take note, tomorrow we are not wearing suit. We are not wearing the African wear. We are wearing uh, sporting apparel for the conference. So please take note. It's my pleasure, before I undertake the next activity, to acknowledge some distinguished uh, dignitaries in our midst. The Municipal Chief Executive of Ufuri Crow Municipal Assembly, representing the Regional Minister, please applaud Honorable Ibrahim Entry. Thank you very much for coming. The Regional Director of Health, Dr. Emmanuel Tinkran, is also in our midst. Thank you for coming. Representing the President of Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association is Mr. Philemon Edu Brimpong. Thank you for coming. We also have in our midst Dr. Richmond Edusa Poku, representing the Executive Secretary of Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana. <laughs> representing the Registrar Veterinary Council of Ghana is Dr. Malon Mensa. Thank you, I can see you. Okay, so it's time 
for the Vice Chancellor's address for this conference. And I'm happy to say it's going to be delivered by a distinguished scientist. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the proof Vice Chancellor of KNUSD, Professor Ellis Ousu Dabo. While the provost was speaking, I was entering, and um, he was talking about how busy sometimes we can be, and uh, we even forget our schedules for exercising. It reminded me that, you know, we started a bicycle club, and I have a bicycle that is parked at the administration. The last time the bicycle saw me, I cannot tell. <laughs> the club that we started, many have been asking me, when is our next cycling episode? And I can't give an answer. It's a, it's a discipline uh, to fiscal activity. And sometimes it's not easy at all, you know, uh, getting, getting uh, these things underway. But it's part of the discipline and the culture of ensuring that fiscal activity uh, is maintained in promoting healthy lifestyle. The chairman for this August occasion, Professor Peter Donko, guest of honor, Dr. Emmanuel Tinkrai, my very good friend, all speakers herein gathered at this conference, the registrar of this university, provosts, past and present, college registrars, the CEO of the Confanochi Teaching Hospital. I, I was uh, performing a function with him yesterday. This morning, this is the third function. <laughs> um, I hope he is here, uh, Professor. Uh, Ochre Adai Mensa, the CEO of the National Health Insurance Authority, the CEO of the Food and Drugs Authority, the Member of Parliament for the Ophorichrom constituency, the MCE of the Ophorichrom Municipal Assembly, also representing the Regional Minister, the Metropolitan Chief Executive, the President of Ghana Medical Association, if you're here, the Acting Registrar, Allied Health Professionals Council, President of the Ghana Association of Biomedical Students and Scientists, President of the Veterinary Association of Ghana, Representative of the Director General of the Ghana Standard Authority, Representative of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana, Presidents, Rectors, and Registrars of the Professional Bodies that are present, all other presidents, registrars of professor, professional bodies present, principals of our training institutions, health training institutions, and the tutors who are here, invited guests, media houses, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to be here to speak for and on behalf of our, of our vice chancellor, Professor Mrs. Rita Kusia Dixon, who has had to be in Accra to chase a few other things. Amongst those is the book and research allowance, which should hit your, your accounts in a few, uh, maybe it shouldn't be more than 48 hours. You should have your book and research allowance. So it's a reason why she, she is not here. She has, she's going to chase. Uh, the, I was expecting a better round of applause, you know. <laughs> Once again, the Biennial Scientific Conference is here, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to this conference. I wish to express my profound gratitude for attending this conference. This is a very, very important conference that was initiated by some past provosts who envisioned a healthy college to ensure that we lived by the dictum practice what you preach and that's why i'm excited about the fact that our moderator has told us that tomorrow we will practice what we preach right here in this room and so for some of you who have not walked for a while there should be some health breaks for them to walk around this building moderator so that they practice what we preach this is a tenth biennial conference of the College of Health Sciences and it promises to be a very exciting one and also insightful. 
the theme promoting healthy life and well-being healthy lifestyles appear an overused topic but you will agree with me that our health and well-being can never be overemphasized indeed none of the sdg 17 would be achieved if the people are not healthy many countries including ghana have adopted health policies targeted at reducing the risk of disease particularly those of chronic non-communicable in origin these policies are aimed at promoting a, a healthy population by encouraging the citizenry to adopt healthy lifestyles and behaviors it is a choice that you make these moves notwithstanding have not yielded the needed results and as we speak it is official that ghana is a dual burden country uh, uh, include that is having both the communicable and non-communicable diseases we are all fully aware that our overall health is impacted by our lifestyles and the choices and behaviors consequentially unhealthy lifestyle behaviors will obviously lead to poor health outcomes and particularly poor dietary practices physical inactivity smoking and alcoholism are major risk factors particularly for non chronic non communicable diseases and these days there are also all other uh, all sorts of uh, uh, conditions that are overwhelming our health systems for those of you who are listening to my joy online this morning you hear about the discussion on dialysis and the overwhelming nature that you know uh, persons presenting with terminal um, renal diseases are confronted with in fact this morning I lost a friend to chronic renal disease just this morning we cannot talk about well-being without mental health as Vikram Patel noted there is no health without mental health mental health is too important to be left to the professionals alone and mental health is everyone's business I believe that by the end of this conference we will individually be able to assess our state of mental health and if you are not able to assess your state of mental health please call me I'll come and assess your state of mental health for you The theme and subtopics of this conference have been carefully selected to address our individual needs and community concerns and to promote sustainable development goal three. The WHO report for 2023 on SDG3 is ensuring good health and promoting well-being for all ages. It acknowledges that some gains and strides have been made to promote people's health in recent years however it mentions in inequalities in healthcare access and says that that still prevails and obviously the COVID-19 pandemic and other ongoing crises have obviously impeded the progress towards the attainment of SDG 3 and it proposes that we can achieve the targets of SDG 3 by doing a few things ensuring healthy lives for all requires a strong commitment but the benefits outweigh the costs healthy people are the foundation for healthy economies countries worldwide are urged to take immediate and decisive actions to predict and counteract the health challenges that confront us Answering the question the battery here has gone down in answering the question what I what I can do the report emphasizes that you can start by promoting and protecting your own health and the health of those around you 
by making well-informed choices and also by raising awareness in your community about the importance of good health and the choice consequentially. At KNUST, our hallmark is to strive in our own small way to the realization of the sustainable development goals to make the world a better place for all. And in fact, as managers of this university, you are aware that we've participated in the GUSA Games. We are harvesting talents. We are having this uh, uh, well-being uh, uh, fortnight walks and, and, and so on, which uh, we've established a wellness center. There are several things that we are doing to ensure that this uh, community is healthy. The conference will thus heighten our own awareness of how we are personally endangering our own lives and well-being and to prepare us to be ambassadors in raising awareness in our communities about the importance of good health and good health choices. In this regard, there will be presentations from seasoned health professionals who will guide us to reassess the value of good health. Again, researchers from this college and beyond will present various studies and reports on this selected theme and the various subtopics. Of note, uh, some distinguished speakers at this conference, and I'm speaking of our keynote, Dr. Emmanuel Tinkrain, the Ashanti Regional Director of Health Services, Mrs. Ifwa Ousuansan, Principal Dietitian, Confanochi Teaching Hospital, Professor Isaac Kinsley Amponsan, uh, who is an associate professor at the Department of Pharmacognosy and the head of the Department for Herbal Medicine, Professor Moses Omuniyi Monday, who is the head of the Department of Physiotherapy and Sports Science, Dr. Ruth Entry, a mental health practitioner at the Confanochi Teaching Hospital, and a lecturer in behavioral sciences here at KNUST, Dr. Granting Tano, is a senior lecturer in the Department of Medicine at the School of Medicine and Dentistry here at KNUS, in a senior specialist, a consultant nephrologist at the Confounder Teaching Hospital. Let me end by this quote from Edward Stanley. Quote, those who have no time for healthy eating will sooner or later have to find the time for illness. End of quote. To say, those who have no time for healthy living will sooner or later have to find the time for the disease that come with it. I am very hopeful that this conference will produce in us a changed mindset and a reorientation about our attitudes. And that would lead to choices that will promote health and make us ambassadors of healthy lives and well-being. Always remember what Henry Wheeler Shaw, the American philosopher of the 19th century said, health is like money. We never have a true idea of its value until we lose it. End quote. And with those words, I'd like to thank you so very much for your rapt attention and I do wish all of us well during the next 48 hours. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pro Vice Chancellor, representing the Vice Chancellor, for your address. Sometimes, when distinguished people are invited, for, uh, to programs, we are told they are not or they were not able to attend because of a very other important assignment. Um, it happened in our case. But uh, as scientists, knowing very well one key responsibility is research, and knowing very well we've been told that the vice chancellor couldn't make it because she is going to work on a book and research allowance, so we conduct research. We all agree that she took the best decision. Shall we applaud the Vice Chancellor? In fact, if the conference had been given the option of choosing that, would you want the Vice Chancellor here or you would want her to go 
and follow, I would have said she should go so that the proof that the chancellor comes. Dr. Emmanuel Tenkra is a medical doctor and a senior public health specialist. He graduated from the University of Ghana School of Medicine and Dentistry with MBCHB in 1991. He holds a Master of Public Health degree, MPH, from the University of Ghana School of Public Health and a Fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians, Public Health, and a Clinical Fellow of Joanna Briggs Institute, University of um, Adelaide, South Australia. Prior to his current position as Regional Director of Health Service from Ashanti Region, Dr. Tinkran had worked in various capacities in the Ghana Health Service including Medical Superintendent of Nsawam Hospital and District Director of Health Service from 1993 to 2001. Deputy Director of Public Health from Eastin and then Brongahafu Regions from 2001 to 2013. As Acting Regional Director of Health Service, Brongahafu Region from 2010 to 2011. And Regional Director of Health Services Western region from 2014 to 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the profile of our keynote speaker who is next to address us on government policies on healthy lives and well-being. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, please applaud Dr. Emmanuel Tenkran, the Shanti Regional Director of Health Services, our keynote speaker. Thank you, and good morning. My brother, Professor Peter Donko, chairman for this function. My brother, the Pro Vice Chancellor, the Pro Woods College of Health Sciences, chairman, scientific conference planning committee, guest speakers, dean of colleges, Distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Ashanti Regional Health Directorate, I would like to thank the provost of the college and the chairman of the planning committee for inviting me to give a keynote address at this conference. Professor Chairman, to attain healthy lives and well-being in Ghana, the government of Ghana has come out with policies and guidelines to promote healthy lives and well-being for all people living in Ghana. The need to promote healthy lives and well-being of all people living in Ghana is enshrined in the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana, Article 34, Clause 2, which amongst others require the state to ensure realization of the right to good health for people living in Ghana, irrespective of color, race, geographical location, religion, or political affiliation. It is expected that all political actors shall be guided by the tenants of this. Government policies on healthy lives and well-being is informed by several global health compacts. Among others, the UN Sustainable Development Goal 3, Agenda 2020 for Sustainable Development, International Health Regulation 2005, the Standard Declaration of Primary Health Care, Africa Union Vision 2063, the Africa We Want. Policies are a statement of intent which guides our actions and thoughts. They are guidelines, rules, protocols, and direction. There are several government policies aimed at promoting healthy lives and well-being. Health is a fundamental human right and a factor for wealth creation and socioeconomic development. World Health Organization defines health as a complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely an absence of disease or infirmity. 
health and well-being of Ghanaian population has improved in the last decade. Average life expectancy live up to 63 years. However, overall improvement in our healthy life and well-being has been slow from desired global targets. Average improvement of 50% as compared to 75% of our MDG 15 targets. Ghana has not achieved the desired level of health because we have not adequately addressed all the key determinants of health. Ghana is recognized as having a complex disease burden. The major health problems include communicable diseases, maternal, perinatal, and nutritional diseases, malaria, HIV, TB, mental health, neglected tropical diseases, and recently, upset of non-communicable diseases. The factor influencing healthy lives and well-being include our physical environment, education, socioeconomic situations, population lifestyles, and demographic characteristics. Our national health policy. Ghana have a policy that is built on the primary health care concept. It's essential health service, which is scientifically appropriate, that's evidence-based, socially acceptable, economically affordable, and universally accessible through community participation. It recognizes that health is a basic fundamental human right and a factor for creating wealth and social development. The principles are political commitment, intersectoral collaboration, community participation, and use of locally affordable technology. The primary health care defines the three levels of health care, that's the community, the sub-districts, and then the district level. Ghana has adopted the universal health coverage. And Ghana's roadmap for attaining universal health coverage provides a framework for strengthening primary health care to achieve universal health coverage and access to best quality of care without upfront payment, thus eliminating financial barrier whilst providing universal access to quality care. To achieve the universal health coverage and emergency preparedness, the health care delivery system recognizes 11 areas requiring strengthening. That's the building block of our health system. The service package, human resource, health technologies and infrastructure, medicines, health training, health care regulation, health information management, partnership for health, community ownership and participation research, and more importantly, leadership and governance. Our national health policy emphasizes that health delivery should be provided using social determin determinants of health. That's one health policy framework to ensure universal health coverage for all guidance and achieve the desired healthy life status for people in Ghana. The vision is a healthy population for national development. And the mission is to work towards the achievement of healthy lives for all people living in Ghana through an enabling policy framework which recognizes, empowers, and brings together in a coordinated manner all stakeholders. The goal is to promote, restore, and maintain good health for all people living in Ghana. And the guiding principles are multisectoral collaboration, strategic partnership, decentralization, equity, citizen involvement, and social accountability. The health policy objectives are five. The first is to strengthen the healthcare delivery system to be resilient. The second is to encourage the adoption of healthy lifestyles. The third is to improve the physical environment. The fourth is to improve the socioeconomic status of the population. 
And the last word is to ensure sustainable financing for health. Under the policy objective one, the nation is to strengthen the healthcare system to be resilient. And Ghana is committed to universal health coverage that all people in Ghana has timely access to high quality health services, irrespective of ability to pay. To improve access to health services, the service is to be delivered through enhanced coordinated network of facilities. That's cheap compounds, health centers, and hospitals, both private and public, to provide appropriate package of healthcare services, preventive, curative, and rehabilitative, palliative, using life course approach to the population. To improve the quality of healthcare delivery, the policy trust is to develop a robust and sustainable quality culture institutionalized in the healthcare delivery system with clear measures in terms of safety, efficiency, effectiveness, timeliness, equity, and patient-centeredness. Under the financial risk protection, the national health policy ensures the strengthening of the national health insurance as well as encourage the population to subscribe to the national health insurance and other private insurance schemes. Under the emergency readiness and management, the policy seeks to strengthen surveillance and response system to prevent, detect, investigate, protect against, control, and provide public health emergencies to the spread of diseases resulting from epidemic and disaster at all levels and recognize animal-human interface. Under the emergency care, the policy seeks to strengthen acute emergency services involving pre-hospital, including ambulance services, hospital emergency services, and disaster and mass casualty. Under the policy objective two, we are to encourage the adoption of healthy lifestyle. That's the first principle. Promote healthy eating, promote good nutrition, increase physical activity, reduce the use and mitigate the negative impact of substance abuse, and encourage and promote safe and responsive sexual behavior. And our policy objective three, the nation is to improve access to potable water, sanitation, and hygiene. Reduce harmful effect of noise, air, and hazardous substances, and improve human settlement and housing, and ensure a safer transportation system. The policy objective for aim to improve socioeconomic status of the population, and is to develop capacity to be economically productive increase employment status of the population, strengthen family and social support systems, and improve community security. Policy objective five is to ensure sustainable financing for health and promote healthy lifestyles. And here, the aim is to increase domestic resource mobilization, prudent investment and planning, and management and efficient allocation of the available resources as a key priority. In addition to the national health policy, there are other key government acts and policies that promote healthy lives and well-being. The first is the Public Health Act, Act 5851. This act regulates all public health activities in the country. And then Ghana Health Service and Teaching Hospitals Act 1996, Act 2525, which provides governance, governance framework for implementing corporate plans and programs. The Mental Health Act 2012, Act 846, provides framework to promote efficient, effective, equitable, 
and mental health services. The local government act 2003, act 656, also provide framework for decentralized institutional arrangements, including the health sector. And the Public Procurement Authority Act 2016 is to provide framework for all public procurement, including that of health. The Public Financial Management Act 921 provides framework for managing all public funds, including that of health service. The Ghana Health Service Strategic Plan also provides overall strategic direction to the service. And the policy objective of the service is to improve universal access to better and efficient managed quality care, reduce avoidable maternal, adolescent, child, and disabilities, and increase access to responsive clinical and public health emergencies. Ghana Health Service Code of Conduct and Disciplinary Procedures provide guidelines for staff conduct and disciplinary procedures. Whilst the patient charter provides framework for patients' rights and responsibilities. To help with the implementation of other programs, we also have program policies. And what will interest us here is the National Policy on Non-Communicable Diseases. The non-communicable diseases constitute a major problem in the country. The policy is aimed at preventing and controlling non-communicable diseases, including heart attack, stroke, cancers, and respiratory diseases. To promote healthy lives and reduce mortality in non-communicable diseases, this will be done through awareness creation and screening of all non-communicable diseases in our healthcare facilities, control of alcohol and drug use, mental health, promote physical activity, healthy diet, and the stress reduction and emotional intelligence, and establishment of wellness clinics, and then referrals. There is also nutrition policy, which is aimed at developing strategies for nutrition activities and other interventions. The key strategy is to build capacity of proving effective nutrition, reduce prevalence of anemia, especially among adolescent girls, provide powder supplements, radiator salt supplementation, and vitamin A supplementation. We also have health promotion strategy policy, and this policy is aimed at strengthening social mobilization and risk communication. And the key strategy is to achieve this through innovative communication, enhance evidence-based research, effective decision-making, strengthening collaboration and partnership, and promote health in all policies for holistic solution. The Integrated Disease Surveillance and Response policy also seeks to enhance program coordination. The strategy is to build capacity, to improve risk communication, support laboratory operations, improve case management, and strengthening isolation and contact tracing. All these policies and many other key policies are designed to improve the healthy lives and well-being of all people living in Ghana. There is a need for political commitment, stakeholder engagement, resource mobilization to promote better life for all people living in Ghana. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regional Director of Health Services for this region. We have another interesting presentation coming up. 
Dr. Elliot Cranton Tano is a senior lecturer in the Department of Medicine of the School of Medicine and Dentistry, KNUST, and a senior specialist physician and consultant nephrologist at the Confuanochi Teaching Hospital. He is a fellow of the International Society of Nephrology after training in Cape Town, South Africa, and a fellow of the West African College of Physicians. He is the chairman of the Young Nephrologist Committee of African Association of Nephrology and a member of the African Regional Board of the International Society of Nephrology, an academic editor of both the PLO's Global Public Health and the Africa Journal of Nephrology. He is a member of the International Society of Nephrology Advocacy Working Group and Educational Committee. He's also the chairman of the Educational Committee of the Ghana Kidney Association. He is part of the first cohort of Emerging Leaders Program of the International Society of Nephrology. Elliot is a senior Atlantic Fellow of Health Equ Equity with the George Washington University, championing health equity in management of non-communicable disease and kidney diseases in Ghana. He is the founder and director of Kidney Health International, a local NGO promoting kidney health in Ghana and beyond. He has over 40 research publications and written 17 educational opinion pieces online on kidney diseases and NCD prevention. He's a kidney health advocate, health promoter, and educates the general public about kidney diseases and its prevention. He has organized free kidney health screening for over 3,000 people, set up renal management teams in five district hospitals in Ghana, visited over 30 radio stations, 12 television stations, and 23 organized groups education, educating on kidney prevention, disease prevention. He has written two books on kidney disease prevention in Ghana. And his presentation couldn't have come at a better time, especially now when there is a discussion on the cost of, um, uh, what do we call it? Dialysis. Um, so the question is, are we a healthy nation? And this is what Dr. Elliot Cranton Tano will be speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we please applaud him? All right, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think I would stand on existing uh, protocols um, so I can make uh, some good quality discussion within my 20 minutes. I keep saying when I go and talk about kidney disease that um, 20 minutes is not even enough to talk about two kidneys. And this time around, I'm not talking about just the kidney, I'm talking about non-communicable diseases generally. And not just in Kumasi, but probably as a nation. So maybe, permit me Mr. Chairman, bypass the existing protocols and I'm hoping that um, after the discussion we'll be able to answer this question. I was given this task to try and find out whether or not we are a healthy nation and I'm not sure. Uh, I have an answer to it but I'm sure we can discuss it and afterwards maybe, just maybe we'll be able to assess ourselves as a nation whether we are healthy or not and maybe if we are not, what can we do to be healthy? So thank you very much. I really honor this invitation. All right, so my objectives within this uh, period is to try and, of course, before we can talk about what, um, whether or not we are healthy, we need to define it and then discuss what the health issues are on the ascendancy, uh, basically in Ghana and in globally, and then what choices we make that makes us unhealthy and what we need to do and why probably I would want to focus more on non-communicable disease. I'm sure a lot of the speakers so far are making us understand that yes, though the malarias and the uh, TBs are killing us, uh, probably there are some silent killers that are killing us more uh, that we are not looking at. And then how we can change our lifestyle as people. All right, so health has been defined already as a, a state of... 
mental and social well-being and not just merely the absence of disease and i think this is very important why because uh, non-communicable disease in most cases will not show any symptoms and unfortunately most people will wait to develop symptoms before they come to us as healthcare providers and unfortunately for most of them by the time they show symptom it's late and i think there's a lot on kidney disease now and i'll probably talk more about that i'll not hide my biasness towards uh, kidney diseases now what determines our health what i'm trying to show you here is the fact that how we are born in terms of our genetics what probably we didn't do anything wrong by virtue of the family you are born in or probably the condition your parents may have had they probably would just there was a, a post i made some time ago saying that most people go about fighting um, over properties that their parents have left particular about the properties their parents have left in them if your dad is a diabetic your mom is a diabetic that is a hypertensive chances are that through no fault of yours you might eventually sometimes develop diabetes and you need to know these things early and then put in measures to prevent it or else we'll run ourselves into trouble so it's of course and what we are eating and i'm sure if i will do justice on the eating so i'll probably not do much there and then what our lifestyles are what do we do like um, it's been said i think pro vc mentioned that he bought it's bicycle and it is gathering dust so probably if we are able to cycle more and then by our lifestyles probably we can even stay uh, healthier our environment and i'm going to touch on things that we do to our environment that will hit us back and again the moment we talk about environment of course in our part of the world we definitely have to hit on galamsey and i'll talk about that uh, very soon when all of these are put together how do we take care of ourselves in case we run into any of these uh, issues and then that's where medicare comes in so again if you are not sick that is okay but if you get sick at least if you have good quality health care chances are that you can bounce back in no time but what happens when even the quality care is there and you cannot afford like most patients with uh, kidney disease for instance now we also need to look at health you know you know as a general sense what we as individuals have a part to play the community has a part to play the environment and of course larger ecosystem but i don't want you to leave this discussion and go like okay it is all up to government so i'm actually going to focus more on what we can do as a people and what lifestyles we can live to be able to stay healthy all right so that is where our focus will be on and i believe that if we make the environment unhealthy we to also affect somebody else so we need each other to survive because i believe that what no man is an island so if you do your bit well if probably you are just interested in making money so you spoil the environment chances are that it's actually going to hurt you and your people and eventually the generations that will come after you so whatever we do we need to think about posterity now i think this point has been made that instead of looking at health and sickness in that order can we look at well-being or wellness which i think is a very good concept so let's not wait to get sick let's do things to keep being healthy and stay away from the hospitals and indeed we know that it goes beyond you know sicknesses it has to do with spirituality of course you know how you get irritated when you don't have money in your pocket for loud and your blood pressures might go just because your wife is stressing you because there's no money at home so all of these things come to play uh, to be able to determine i mean how healthy or otherwise we are so basically let's try and look at health as a spectrum from being perfectly healthy or for that matter positive health, to of course death at the other end but the key issue with most diseases are that indeed they come to us when we are not expecting they are sitting there they are unrecognized and they are probably mild and more often than not people gloss over them and if you do that we run ourselves into trouble and we want to bring in the issue that listen let's not wait to get sick let's become more interested in staying healthy and these are things that uh, focus uh, more on or else the disease becomes severe and of course you may need to now uh, get into the health facility and again depending on the state of your pocket nowadays the way the health system has become you probably might uh, die of uh, the disease that you suffered now again spectrum of the disease comes from building what we call risk factors in our part of the world so the more risk factors you have the more your chances of getting sick the less risk factors you have the less your chances of getting sick but the point is that sometimes by just growing 
born, you increase risk factors. I made you understand by where you are born, the environment you are in, some risk factors that build uh, with time. Now, you are black alone. Most uncommunicable diseases, hypertension, diabetes, uh, kidney disease, and all, by virtue of the fact that you are born black alone, increases your risk of these things. And that is about uh, a bit worrying. Now, Oh, so I'll spare the females for a moment. You are a male a risk of some of these non-communicable diseases higher than females. The moment they get to menopause, we all become equal. So that is what we need to know. Are you 40 and above? All right. Then again, risk factors you know, begin to pop up. So indeed, these things I've mentioned, they are not big deals. They are not, you know, something that is out of uh, ordinary. But then you cannot stay as a 40-year-old black man and tell me that for the past year you have your blood pressure or for the past one year you have not checked your sugar you cannot because these things are by themselves factors and we need to be very uh, careful about these things okay now i mentioned the family in which you are born now one of the interesting things i see mr chairman in my clinic is that you see uh, um, a young man probably about 40 45 who is bringing let's say the 60 year old or let's say 65 year old mom uh, to the hospital and you ask okay mom is diabetic and you ask have you checked your sugar whether or not you are diabetic and you say no and i would ask mom oh mom when did you develop the diabetes so at 65 he tells me oh about 20 years ago so i mean if you go back he she developed the diabetes out of the age that this gentleman is mother and he has not even considered the fact that i should also check mine you know we are in a habit where we wish things off okay it is not me it is my mother she didn't do things right but then we need to be particular that these things might you know uh, come to us and then again what i'll say we have become a generation of sitters all right so from probably well nine o'clock up till now we have been sitting and we'll be sitting for long and that's why i got excited i think tomorrow we are going to wear t-shirts not sit for long. We are probably doing now so generation of sitting up in the morning we sit in our we drive to our workplaces we sit in our offices we go back sit back in our car come and sit back at home and the cycle continues and all of these things are by nature risk factors that increases our risk of getting diseases a scientist so before we talk about anything we need to measure on what rubric or what uh, criteria are we using for health um there are so many can measure the health of a nation the birth and death rate by probably life expectancy which is actually the what is used. by the quality of life of a group of people uh, by the mobilities of specific conditions. okay people are dying from the condition so we can measure health by uh, that the environmental factors is a as to whether you to get um could this be any better? Yeah. As to whether you can be able to get some ambulatory care in case you get sick and inpatient care. So all of these things are metrics by which we go to health. Now, I'll try and focus on the ones that will make a bit of more uh, meaning to us in terms of mobility of specific conditions, uh, the life expectancy, and then the birth and, uh, rates. To be able to ask ourselves, the people, are we healthy? Now, Let's start with life expectancy. So there's the current data. So I tried to compare Ghana to the rest of the world. So the country with the highest life expectancy is Hong Kong. So people are living up to 87.9 years. That's virtually 88 years for the females. And indeed, the country with lowest um, life expectancy is Chad, right here in Africa, which is 54. And Ghana, we are sitting there somewhere around 67 of we want to compare ourselves to the higher one. So maybe I ask, are we a healthy nation or could we be healthier? Now, let's look at Ghana in comparison to Southern Africa or for that matter, Africa and the rest of the continents. What do we see? We see that at least across Africa, maybe there's something to be excited about. Not bad at all. But then, <laughs> so sometimes we need to be excited more. But then when we compare ourselves to other continents, then we are probably a bit of a shortfall there. So it is very important that, yes, we are not doing bad, but there is, like teachers who say when we're growing up, room for what? Improvement. Okay. Now, the global burden of disease is actually a database that actually helps us to look at things in perspective. And if you go on to this, you are able to see how health conditions uh, have changed over the, in terms of their 
in terms of the mortalities. And it is very important that we look at this to try and see ourselves comparing from maybe 2019 to maybe now, how well are we doing? So the most comprehensive worldwide data, and they actually have put together data sources, almost about 300,000. So probably this is something to work with. So let's look at this. I'm hoping it's projecting well. Good. And we look at 1990. Am I getting a OK, thank you. Hello, hello, yeah. We look at uh, from 1990 um, as uh, the global picture, basically. And just look at the top five. I mean, just focus on the top five. You realize that indeed, as of 1990, globally, cardiovascular diseases were still the number one. But we probably were not looking at it because that was not our problem in our part of the world. Now, what we realize is that in, the 19, in 2019, these cardiovascular conditions, or should I say non-communicable disease, have increased. So the blue you see are the non-communicable diseases, the red are the uh, communicable diseases. So let's look at it that way. So what we are realizing is that we started off as a 40%, if you are just looking at the top five, and then now some years down the line, now the non-communicable diseases are now the top killers globally. Okay, so somebody will say, okay, that's the global picture. Who cares? So I'll probably show you what is happening in Ghana. So like we already knew, of course, infectious disease was our thing, you know, uh, all these years. So infectious disease, and that made cardiovascular or non-communicable disease just about 20%. But now, what we are seeing is that now cardiovascular uh, disease is now sitting at the top. And this is Ghana. And then you are looking at 2019 already. So if they're able to put it together, um, chances are that we'll probably pull more non-communicable disease. And that is why we need to look here. Because the things that are killing us are not just the infections anymore, but it's non-communicable uh, diseases. So what have we realized? From a 20% to also a 40%. And this is Ghana. So now let's zoom in now into... What is really killing us? So there's global bed, and I'm sure maybe they didn't get their data source as well. So let's look at what the numbers are. How many are dying? Let's go to the mortuary and find out those who are dying. What is killing us? Okay. So I found this uh, paper that actually looked at about 37-year review of people who have died in the university hospital in Accra. And what we realized is that looking at about 3,000 deaths, now about 60% are from non-communicable disease. We need to look more at this. And what they realize is that the death from the malaria and the TB and the diarrhea diseases are what? They are decreasing. So we are getting something right there. But as we get, this, uh, get it right there, we probably need to focus a bit more on the non-communicable disease. So like we know, the epidemiological transition is changing. So as per that data, what we now realize is that over the period, now it is the non-communicable diseases that are killing us more, and then the, the, non, uh, the communicable diseases are what? Reducing, just like I just showed you. Why is this so? Focus has always been on there's a lot of money for malaria. There's a lot of money for HIV. Of course, COVID drops and there's plenty of money for because policymakers and governments know that, hey, when people are getting the COVID, it's communicable. So we'll get it. But we probably don't look at non-communicable that way. You have done your something and you have gotten your diabetes or your hypertension or your kidney disease. We can blame you for it. And of course, if you have it, it doesn't affect me. Then the point is that unfortunately, they probably don't worry so much about it until a relative or a family member or something gets, let's say, chronic kidney disease. And then we know that here in this country, when you get chronic kidney disease and you need dialysis and you don't have money, I'm sorry to say you are going to die. Even if you have money, then it becomes tough because of, of course, the human resource and all that you have to spend coming to the hospital for the regular checkup. So it is indeed very important that we focus and make sure that policymakers think about the non-communicable disease more. But what is the global problem now? It's actually because less than 1% of all the money that is voted into health only goes into non-communicable disease. So probably we need to vote more into it. And of course, when it happens like that, we can, you can imagine that the low and middle income countries like ours will probably also suffer the same pinch. Now, this same uh, data also actually tells us that, let's say, uh, an example, hypertension, where about 31% of people had hypertension. The problem is that majority, and I'm actually going to show you something that shows, shows that majority of patients who get conditions and even are able to identify it are not able to get the needed medication to be able to support it. And again, this is actually what makes the disease a bit more worrying. Now, let me just talk more about these non-communicable disease and show you how 
bigger a problem in our part of the world or in low and middle income countries. So it's killing about 41 million people a year. Um, about 74% of all deaths globally are due to non-communicable diseases. Now, less than 70 uh, years of age, about 15, uh, 17 million people are dying from what? Non-communicable diseases. And it's even worse in low and middle income countries where we have about what? 86% of these premature deaths. So then when we talk about premature deaths, death that should not have happened get worried when I hear premature death because I see it every day. When you talk about global numbers, so probably, again, my biasness towards kidney disease, pardon me. When we talk about, go for conferences, where people are talking about average age on dialysis, 60 years, 70 years. Indeed, most of the global data that they give, they give us in our test books is that risk factors for kidney disease starts from age 60. And I can understand because people who get it are beyond 60. But here in Ghana, the, the age of kidney failure is 47 years. 47 years. So personally, I have pushed those to 40 years that I believe beyond age 40, begin to ask yourself how well your kidneys are doing. So, and again, that's why people will die prematurely. People who probably should not have died. And that is why we need to focus on non-communicable diseases, for which is causing about 43% of our mortalities currently in Ghana. What are these non-communicable diseases? It's been mentioned. So, of course, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, stroke, and all of that, diabetes, uh, chronic respiratory conditions, COPD, and all, uh, late onset asthma, and all are actually big uh, problems. And of course, the numerous uh, cancers that we know about, or know of, are also on the ascendancy. Somebody keeps asking, is it now that they are increasing, or probably they were there? Chances are that maybe they were there and we're not picking, or probably through again our lifestyle. We are eating and stuff. We are increasing our chances of some of these uh, cancers. So why are we like playing the ostrich? If we don't identify the risk factors, how would we know these conditions and be able to deal or prevent these conditions? So it's important that as you sit, and I'm speaking to you, reflect on your own risk factors. And that is what will cause you to be able to make that effort to know how well your body is functioning. Because the as you age, it is as to age. Now, so this is actually some survey that was done in um, a hospital um, in Accra. And what did they show? They were able to show that about 27% of, you know, the uh, people they sampled had non-communicable diseases. Hypertension prevalence about 22%, and more than half of them, of course, are alcohol consumers. Alcohol taking in some quantity is, you know, a social thing. But again, too much alcohol, we know it's a risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. And then over half of them, again, are physically inactive. Again, inactivity is a problem. Now, let's not go far. So this is a study that was done here in KNUST, I think it was led by um, Dr. Brenya and Provost um, was also a part of this study. And what did we show? These are lecturers. So everything you see here, lecturers, KNUST, virtually all the uh, uh, departments were involved in this. I about, about, think about 300 uh, to 270 uh, lecturers were surveyed. What did we find? Average age, 46 years. 46 years. So not very old, 46. Now, what are we picking? This is KNUST. 28.2% have some form of non communicable disease. That's what they're actually reporting. What we would find that probably we don't know my add to it, but let's keep to this number. Now, 20% beyond 40 had never checked their blood pressure before. All right? So, again, we need to be particular about our own selves. Yeah, the stress of has to be done, marking and all, but... We need to, as lecturers, we need to, as faculty, be sure that we are also healthy. What did we find? That 66.8, so let's say about 70%, had hypertension, uh, but 19 had not, do not often check. So the point is that even if you know you have hypertension, which was a huge number, about 66% with hypertension, now they were not checking their blood pressures. The key thing is that getting to know you have hypertension is one thing. You checking it and making sure it's controlled is the best. Knowing taking medications and not getting control, you still increase your risk of, you know, uh, death. So we need to be particular about this. We're about almost 20% have diabetes and about 80%, and that for me was the scary part, 80% ever since they became lecturers had never checked their sugar before. Average age, 46, 
You have not checked your sugar before. If you were you employed, let's say, five years ago, ten years ago, six years ago, I don't know what. So let's pay particular attention to our health, I would say. Now, are we hitting targets in terms of our screening, basically? So this was a survey that we did here in the Ashanti region. Where we, it was a May measurement month, we were checking blood pressures and we were able to uh, check about 5,000 people's blood pressures. And this is Kumasi data. Uh, the mean age of the people we sampled was about 39. Uh, prevalence of hypertension here in the Ashanti region, uh, based on this data, was 37%. So one out of three people you see around walking in the streets above 18, that's actually what we used, have hypertension. So if I'm to count three people, chances are that one of you has hypertension. That is how common hypertension is. Now, the point is that, and I'm going to go through, there are a lot of 60s, 60s, 60s years, which I saw that I was a bit worried about. What are some of these 60s? People will check their blood pressure to pick that they were in the range of hypertension and did not know were two thirds. So people walking around thinking that, oh, you know, everything is fine, and they had hypertension and they did not know were two thirds. Now, those who knew that they had hypertension, and they were not taking medication. Again, we're two thirds. So, oh, you can't tell me. I know that I have hypertension, but do you take medication? Oh, I took for one month and I stopped. Two thirds. Now, those who were taking medication, so these ones are, oh, yes, I know I have hypertension. Oh, yes, I'm taking medication. We check their blood pressures, and guess what? Two thirds also were not hitting targets. So, if you go through the stream, you realize that even those who know it, are not even controlling it well. And that is actually what increases the mortality. Again, the same risk factors, age, alcohol, overweight, obesity, and again, family history of hypertension were these risk factors that we found in this uh, study. Now, let's look at some of the uh, uh, non-communicable disease we have. So these are various studies um, that looked at various uh, non-communicable disease that we know. So hypertension, uh, the systematic review in Ghana shows that about 35%. So again, one third of people above 18 have hypertension. Chronic kidney disease, 13%. That is what our data shows. So if I count 100 people in this room, chances are that some 13 of you have some form of kidney disease. I'll repeat it. If I count about 100 of you in this room, chances are that some 13 of you have some form of kidney disease. And I need you to check your kidney function because normally it doesn't show symptoms. And I think that is the one thing I always try to drum home. Now, diabetes is about 6.4, you know, percent. This is actually what we have in terms of the prevalence in this country. So about uh, 7 out of 100 people. Stroke, about 2.6%. Uh, percent. Now, for cardiovascular diseases, the data I was able to get are hospital-based. So in the hospital, um, if they are, we are able to survey people who have come normally, People with hypertensive heart disease, cardiomyopathies, and all are uh, what I am showing now. So these are hospital-based studies. The one that I showed you are general population. So I would, that's why I can say general population like us. But these ones are hospital-based studies. But what I'm trying to show you here are the fact that these things are there and people are getting them. Then the cancers actually are the ones I finished up with. So from the breast cancer, that's actually the majority, cervical cancer, liver cancer, prostate cancer. You are uh, 60, uh, 45 years, your parent or your mom, your, sorry, your dad died from a prostate CA or something. You need regular checks. You cannot wish it off because sometimes it might be costly. Now, I just put the slide in after I talk on uh, radio this morning because now there's a topical issue, and I think uh, Pro uh, VC also mentioned that in the sense that now Kolebu decided to make it clear that, listen, now dialysis is more expensive than we thought it was. Now they've increased. So there's a post. This, this is just how somebody sent to me. Is this true? And the truth of the matter is it is true. Why? Because the cost of consumables have gone up and it's become more costly to manage patients with kidney disease. And that is why we need to be very particular about it. So now it's about 700. Comfanoche, or the CEO is not here yet. We've not increased our prices yet. So it's still hovering around. What Comfanoche does is uh, the cost of the dialysis, they say, is about 300. But you buy your this and buy your that. So together, it comes to about 500. But I'm sure now that Kolebu has taken the lead, just maybe sooner than later, they'll be increasing it. But the point is that let's not wait to get a disease. Let's rather prevent it. And I think that is what I keep hammering. Let's prevent it. We cannot prevent it if we don't assess our risk. So what is the risk? Some of the risk factors I mentioned, I'm sure you have listened, and probably it applies to you. So don't sit aloof. 
I keep saying, you ask somebody, what is your shoe size? Oh, I wear 42, 46. I ask, what's your latest blood pressure? Um, I've not checked it. Oh, what's your bra size? Oh, I wear for something, something D, something, something C, right? Oh, what is your last sugar check? I've never checked it. We need to know our numbers. So I wrote, you know, this article for Graphic Online where I just ask one simple question that, listen, just try to know your numbers. So take one day in the year. I suggest that it could be your birthday. Instead of eating more junk food on your birthday, Rather, why don't you use that to assess how healthy you are? You are one year older, your one year risk is increasing. So probably you need to see how to, to manage your risk. Oh, you've checked your blood pressure, it is fine. You checked your sugar, it is fine. Oh, your BMI is intact. You feel good about yourself, isn't it? Then you move on. Oh, we realize that, oh, there's a bit of a problem. You start working on it, you probably get a cycle, and you start riding to bring the weight down, and I think that will be um, helpful. And because of that, you know, I try to write a book. Again, because kidney disease is such a big problem, and people know very little about it, I actually decided to put together, these are 20 risk factors, this is for kidney disease alone, which applies for most other things, which I believe that you can find somewhere. Now, um, if I is going to do justice on diet, so I'm not going to talk more, but I cannot talk about non-communicable disease. Um, oh, people are liking the food they see, huh? Yeah, make, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so <laughs> but the point is that this is how your plate probably is supposed to look like. Not the other one. And I'm sure if we will talk more about that, so I've probably so let's reduce our salt, at least for the sake of hypertension. You know, there are some people they buy food from outside which is already salty. They will not even test it. They take the salt and then they shake it. You know, so please, that is hypertension, looking you straight in the face. And then fatty diet, of course, cutting down your carbohydrates. So these are key things. Of course, smoking is always a risk factor, so don't hide in your room and smoke because you increase your cardiovascular event. And again, alcohol. You know, some people are addicted to alcohol, like tied to this man's leg, and they cannot do without. You are just increasing your risk. And all the stress that we go through one way or the other are all risk factors. Let's check them and prevent ourselves. I put together this um, article again, bias towards kidney disease, but that information on alcohol cuts across for everything and it's alarming how much alcohol we take as a country and this was some time ago 2013 uh, together so 30 million liters people are drinking really people are really drinking and again the world over we are drinking about 2.6 billion bottles of beer amazing so please let's not drink a lot i think yes yeah, a bit here and there of course we know it's good for the heart but when it's enough, that is the problem. So please, don't start it if you are not drinking. And like I mentioned, let's not keep sitting, all right? So what one thing to show, as we grow, as we increase in positions and all of that, we probably will not have time to exercise. But use your regular activities as exercise. Instead of picking a phone and calling the person from the next office, why don't you walk up to the person? In Confuanoche, for instance, I have told myself, I'm never, ever going to use the lift. I would always use the stairs. Sometimes, yes, you pant a bit, but at least when you get there, dash straight into your office. They say, I should wrap up. Yes, Agronayede, you see. Thank you very much. So let me wrap up now. Now let me just show you um, this, what we can do. Three simple things. This uh, paper is showing. You can find the paper and read. Three simple things that we can do to prevent about 90, let me just show you now, 94 million deaths in 25 years, all right? So they looked at 2015 to about 2014. Three simple things. What are they? Making sure that if you have hypertension, you are taking medication, they target at least if 70 people are taking their blood pressure medications, we are good. And then reducing salt intake reducing salt intake, and then decreasing trans fat. So trans fat are all of those fat that you see on the shelves, you know, the margarines and the butter that are cheap for you to buy. They are all risk factors. When we do this, we probably will not run ourselves into trouble. Now, pediatricians are here. They are looking me in the face, so I have to say something about pediatrics. Now, how well are we taking care of the environment? So I decided to use what the pediatric society actually mentioned, that listen, if we don't take care about this galancé issue, it is not just about us, but it's about our children and about our children's children. So we should be mindful because there are issues that these things can do uh, basically to our children. There are cognitive effects, so eventually we'll have precedents later in life. We probably cannot tell how they can govern this, their, their country. So please, let's be mindful of things we do that would affect us. This was a catchy, you know, um, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, 
discussion because it was on Galamse. It was not exactly what I said, but that is how they captioned it and people took it on. But I got excited because it gave me space to talk about kidney disease. But the point in this, uh, um, this was uh, Joy Online, was the fact that kidney disease had gone up by four times. We discussed a bit and talked about Galamse and then the journalists, they decided to do their thing. They put it together that I say that Galamse is what has pushed it up. But guess what? It, 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 it caught fire. Um, Al Jazeera got interested they came to talk to me about it and I think, feel that okay then if we're able to talk more about kidney disease then so be it so I'm wrapping up by saying that uh, kidney disease is a problem uh, sorry now look at me um, now um, uh, environmental factors are a problem if we probably don't deal with this galamse well and when we talk about the galamse it's about cancers uh, increasing respiratory conditions asbestosis and all and we are seeing them Injuries at the Galamse site, we all know some people just died, you know, just by being there. So these are dangerous uh, that we need to be mindful of. Mercury affects the kidneys, it affects your nervous system, your GI, and then your respiratory system. I beg you, let's see what best we can do. I know the powers that be, so far as Galamse is concerned, goes beyond us. But then the point is that in and around Galamse site, we also know high commercial sex workers, and again, HIV, STIs become our problem, and then again, they use a lot of drugs which affect us. So finally, what are we saying? Are we a healthy nation? Your guess is as good as mine. But I think that we need to put in these intentional lifestyle practices to be able to ensure that we live well. Our nation is in our hands and we need to live um, healthy to be able to ensure that we serve best our generation. Whatever you are doing now, you can do it better if you are healthy. Probably if you are not healthy, you will not be able to do it. Thank you very much and for your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for our second presenter. And I'm happy to say um, I don't drink. And since you said if you don't drink, don't taste it, that's good. I only tried uh, some shandy just to feel how it is, but I don't know if you classify that as drinking. Please note that the T-shirt, the conference T-shirt you've been given is what you will wear tomorrow. And like I said, um, so you wear the T-shirt and the complementing ones will be sporty, right? Because we'll be exercising tomorrow. So take note. Um, representing the Director General of Ghana Standards Authority, I will please want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Samuel Kofi Frimpong. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, so we've had two distinguished personalities, males, deliver this. Our third speaker is a very special creation of God. So before she comes, we'll have to pave the way with a musical interlude. Eja Konimo, please.
Thank you once again, Ejako Odimo. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been seated for quite some time. And like we said, we'll be living the theme of this conference. So it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Moses Omoni to take us through uh, some few minutes of stretching. Then we'll continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've themed this year's conference um, promoting healthy lifestyles and well-being. Uh, many of the conferences over the past years have been on infectious disease and the disease. So this year the planning committee of which I chair uh, decided to have a look at the various issues of uh, non-communicable diseases which touch um, on lifestyle. And um, so basically we'll be looking at uh, various metabolic disorders um, and, and, and um, issues of stress, um, all of which could impact on our work here. Uh, we're going to have um, addresses from the Regional Director of Health Service, who will be looking at the various policies of the um, Ghana Health Service in terms of the SDG3, which addresses um, healthy lifestyles. And then um, the rest of the speakers are all within the college here. Uh, we'll have um, a talk on, on um, lifestyles in general, looking at uh, how they are impacted by um, um, non communicable diseases such as hypertension, um, diabetes. There will also be some talk about how um, galamse is impacting on some of these diseases um, by one of our senior lecturers in the Department of Medicine. Um, Dr. Um, Tano, and then we'll zoom into the whole issue of nutrition. Um, this is also answer. Um, nutrition is important. We have many food staffs in this country. I believe that when we eat, it will impact positively on our lifestyles. But it's not just it, how we eat it, um, our portion sizes, etc. Um, so we'll have um, some talk on that. And then we all know how important mobility is. Uh, we need to exercise. Um, Ken UST as a university itself organizes these um, health um, walks um, regularly with aerobic sessions. And we'll have a talk on why it is important that we exercise, how much of it we need to be doing, how little of it we need to be doing to impact positively um, on our health. Um, then also, um, we're going to have a talk by um, one of our mentors. All right. Oh, sorry.
um, with theme. Where she's been working for the past 11 years. She is a preceptor for nutrition and dietetic student from the University of Ghana, the University of Cape Coast, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and the University of Allied Health Sciences. Mrs. Osu Ansa is an of the 2020 African Nutrition Leadership Program and Mashav Program in Israel where she was one of a two-member team that won the best proposal for 2016. She has a special interest in making research in nutrition more practical and has worked with Premium Foods Limited from 2019 to date as a nutrition consultant to formulate and fortify cereal legume mix for the prevention and management of malnutrition in the general populace. She's also the CEO of Enjoy Your Health Consult Limited, a private-owned enterprise that seeks to offer nutrition-related services to individuals and groups. She volunteers to educate the public every Friday on Oyeripa Radio during the midday news broadcast and collaborates with other media houses like Adum FM, Fox FM, Ultimate FM, and others. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, speaking on what should we be eating for good health, please welcome Mrs. Ifwa Osu Ansa. Good morning once again. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I stand on all existing protocols so that we will be able to redeem the time. I can dare say that we all have bank accounts. If not uh, so much money that we want, at least there is enough money. And we are working so hard to fill these bank accounts so that Currently, we can live comfortably as well as when we are no more working, we can afford to live the kind of life that we want to live. But is this the same question I, ca I can get the same answer from if I ask, what investment have you made in your body? Because this money that you want to spend is the same body that is supposed to be spent on. So are you going to use the money for medication as Dr. Elliot mentioned? Or you are going to use it to go to the Bahamas or go to Akosombo and be able to chill out with your family and friends and not have any issue about medications or um, any other thing that will affect your quality of life? By the end of this presentation, I hope that I'll be able to give you some pointers and things that you can do if you've been diagnosed of any condition, what you can eat to help regulate or prevent the onset of complications. If you've not been diagnosed, how to eat well to prevent these conditions from happening. I'll jump some of the, the things because Dr. Elliot has already mentioned the genesis of good health, what meal pattern is the best based on evidence, uh, food variety, timing, and the quantity of meals that we are expected to have. Let's see our bodies as a gun, this pistol that you see right now. The risk factors are the bullets that need to be loaded in this gun. These risk factors are in varying levels and they need to be complete in the gun so that they will be triggered. Dr. Elliot has mentioned part of these uh, risk factors, the non-modifiable factors, those that you don't have control over. So the DNA, your age, your sex, you can do all the plastic surgeries that you, you want, but the DNA will speak for itself that you are a male or a female. Then lastly, our environment. So with all the non-modifiable factors, does it mean we can't do anything? These modifiable factors are our responsibilities for us to eat well and not complete the bullets that need to be 
for it to be triggered. Then the exercise. I intentionally brought the dancing aspect. When we see exercises, it's all about more of the stretching, more of the walking. But you going to church and intentionally dancing is part of the exercise that you need to. The rest of the week, if you don't have the chance, church gives you no less than 30 minutes of dancing every Sunday. And we can capitalize, capitalize on that, this will help you not to have this gun being triggered for you to be diagnosed of diabetes, hypertension. Even if it is well controlled, you will never have the quality of life that you would have had without this medication. What can we do? In terms of diet, we have something we call epigenetics. We can't change the DNA, but the, the DNA, but we can change the expression of this DNA in the body. Some of these DNA are specific to the diagnosis of diabetes, chronic diseases, and all the family history issues that we talk about. But nutrition is able to change when it might even delay or prevent the onset of these conditions. I will begin the diet or specifically what we should eat with a meal pattern. Now we know of blood group diet, we know of ketogenic diet, we know of Atkins diet, we know of many diets. I'm yet to know of Ghana diet. But um, everything that we recommend is evidence-based. What is the evidence telling us? The meal pattern I'm going to recommend is the Mediterranean diet. It has stood the test of time. A lot of, a lot of interventional studies have been conducted to prove its efficacy in the prevention and management of non-communicable diseases. And this was proposed by Ansel Keys, who died almost 101 to his birthday. And he lived long. This was a diet, a traditional diet from countries that lived along the Mediterranean basin. And they realized that at that point in time, they had virtually no incidence and prevalence of cardiovascular disease. So Keys wanted to find out what is different, what risk factor are they not contributing to the other non-modifiable factors that is causing them to have either no or very low levels or numbers of non-communicable diseases. And they found out that I will be giving you the component, but Mediterranean diet has been um, recognized by UNESCO as a cultural her heritage for those countries that were studied, Greece and other countries, although France didn't join the study. It has also been recognized by FAO as a, an environmentally friendly and sustainable diet that if we are to adapt, will help the environment as well as for us to get the best out of it. The components include daily consumption of grains and cereals, which Ghana, we have a lot. It also includes olive oil as the main source of oil that we need to use. I know almost all of us are taking salaries, but it's difficult for us to buy one liter of olive oil for 300 Ghana cities. And we can use that for within a week, it's gone. I will, I will, I will, by the end of this presentation, I will let you know some of the ways that you can include olive oil in your diet. But as, as Provisi said, if you've never been sick before, you try, you try any sickness, not any of these non-communicable diseases. The impact or what it will draw out of your lifestyle is more than whatever money you use to eat healthy. It also recommends moderate intake of red wine. It recommends moderate intake of fish, poultry, eggs, sweets, and potatoes. And they say moderate, but in Ghana, with every meal that we have, there is fish or chicken or some beef in it every day. That's what we do. Then monthly intake of red meat. There is also regular physical activity. These are the components. Now let's go into the specifics. With the legumes and the nuts, we know they are high in poly and monounsaturated fats, which are very good for the heart. 
the fruits and vegetables contain uh, phenolic and, and polyphenol compounds that are known to lower the risk of, um, of uh, all-cause mortality for congenital heart diseases, type 2 diabetes, adiposity, and as well as um, colon rectal cancer. And resveratrol, that one we know about, it benefits already. Olive oil is also known to have phenolic compounds that help lower the risk of these cardiovascular diseases that we are mentioning. Omega-3 is chiefly gotten from uh, fish oils or intake of fish. The summary of the benefits of Mediterranean diet, it's known to lower lipid level, it's known to uh, provide some antioxidative effect, it's known to also have anti-inflammatory effect because we know for diabetes, for instance, it's purely inflammatory disease. It's also uh, known to modify the hormone and growth factors as well as inhibit the nutrient sensing pathways. It's also known to regulate the gut microbiota. Now, let's go to the macronutrients, the food types. Carbohydrates. This study conducted by Compass, I try to use more systematic reviews as much as possible, which is the, almost the highest form of evidence you have. It's known that not all carbohydrates are carbohydrates. We have good quality ones, and the quality ones are those that have not been sifted, polished, or sieved. So you have all the fiber content intact. And in Ghana, if you come to uh, our banku or etzel, or we don't sieve them. These are whole grain foods that if we are to include in our diet, will increase the fiber content in our meal. What's the essence of the fiber? Fiber helps in sugar regulation. It helps with our weight. It helps in the, with the intestinal bio, microbiota by modulating their composition as well as favoring the release of metabolites like uh, short-chain fatty acids, which include butyrates, acetates, and pyrupenates. In terms of protein, protein is... A study done by Agnes Pedersen, it showed that in the population that they used, animal protein was positively related to obesity in men aged 40 years to 55 years. But vegetable protein was rather inversely rela related to obesity in the same population. It also realized that there was an inverse relationship between soya bean intake and LDL cholesterol which we know is the so-called bad cholesterol. It's also known that uh, in the, the vegetable oil uh, provide an inverse relationship with uh, all-cause uh, cardiovascular mortality. These are the benefits comparing animal protein and proteins. With fat and oils, it's not every fat that is fat. This study uh, from the evidence that they got from the systematic review showed that it is best that we replace saturated fat with poly and mono unsaturated fats. And I, I already mentioned the source of poly and mono unsaturated fat. These are from the seeds, legumes, and the nuts that we will eat. The saturated fats mainly are coming from our animal proteins. And they are the ones that line our vessels and increase our likelihood of being diagnosed with uh, any heart disease that is related to the vessels. Then, uh, it's also, this study also proposed that we should avoid industrial trans fatty acids. These are the big goose, the biscuits that we eat, no matter high, how high fiber it is. I won't mention any brand. So far as commercially baked or fried, so as our both roots, Ghana both roots, all our spring rolls and the meat pies, these are all high in trans. And this is not to be reduced. We are supposed to avoid them as much as possible. Someone will say, I will go for meetings, I don't eat those. So what, what can contribute to that? In your homes, how many times do you fry in the same oil? Mostly in Ghana, we fry in it till it is dark. Then we use it for shito. 
And, and that kind of oil is very high in trans fat. And that's more of the reason why buying anything that is commercially fried, they fry in it. And as the oil is going down, they pour new ones in it. So if we are to do any lab analysis, find that there are some types of oils that are more than 50 years old. In terms of the meal variety, diversity, it's like a team. As a family, we all have our, our bats the character or the behavior that we, we are praying to God to help us to uh, live away or not to do again. The same way if we are to vary our meal choices, what is a negative in one meal will be a positive in the other. So it will tend to balance things out. This study conducted by, um, I think, this, this study showed that there is, in terms of um, kidney disease, High dietary diversity is able to increase the estimated glomerular filtration rate. So you just varying your diet, not getting stuck to your supposed uh, favorite food. I am a fancy coming from Winneba. So I like my dokun etzel, and we say that one is paracetamol. We eat it breakfast, lunch, supper. It doesn't mean that so far as I'm not adding so much oil, it's a healthy meal. It is, but I am not diversifying it, so I am not able to get all the nutrients that I'll be able to get from other nutrients or food items. This study was done in Korea among Filipino um, immigrant women, and they found out that women who were able to diversify their food or have more food choices had lower uh, abdominal obesity. And we know for diabetes diagnosis and most of these cancers, it's just your missed session. A study done here in KNST found out that in, in Ghana, using BMI as a predictor of cardiovascular disease is not the best one. Ours is the missed session, our waist circumference. So if you think you have sicker flow or because you gave birth to five children, you have that excuse. It's really a risk factor for you to be diagnosed with any of these conditions. The timing of meals. Rochelle Davis found that you eating at uh, outside the regular daytime hours poses a lot of risk to your, your, your life or in terms of puts you at higher risk of being diagnosed with any condition. Why do we say that? Uh, it's known that Eating, especially in the night, and most of us, we are working late. Oh, I'm chewing vegetables, or I'm eating fruits as an excuse for us to eat in the night. It's known to change the, the, the metabolism of nutrients during the day. It also disrupts the microbiota as well as your appetite hormone. So you just eating late in the night, thinking that it's something healthy, so far as the timing is wrong, whatever you are eating is wrong. This study also found that uh, in terms of meal frequency, those who eat more than two or three times in a day, they have higher risk factors for these non-communicable diseases. How can we do that? Most of us pick on foods. In our offices, we have biscuits, we have nuts, and we have these almonds, pistachios in our offices, and we keep munching on them, thinking that they are healthy. But you are not giving the body enough time to assimilate what you have eaten. So it becomes a risk factor for you. And it's known that regular periodic fasting period also gives the body enough time to really uh, reset itself and give you a better uh, life or well-being. Some of the benefits of eating at regular times or uh, in terms of meal frequency is you are able to reduce inflammation level. It, it improves your, um, your uh, it reduces your stress resistance as well as increase your autophagy and modulate your micro, microbiota. I mentioned microbiota, microbiota. It is something that is part of our immune system that if you are to improve, will help you to have a healthy life. 
meal quantities, we know that in terms of portion sizes, if you le le eat your meal as a ga typical Ghanaian, <laughs> you will grow uh, uh, bigger in terms of your weight. Because we concentrate more on the carbohydrates to fill us up. And some of us will eat our fufu and throw away the soup. Because that is what uh, we, we think is healthy or is good for us. Food-related behavior. What will make us to change our minds? There are many things that we can do. But this study found out that nutrition education, as you hear every day, will somehow push your chance when you plate and will let you ask many questions about your diet but amongst children they found out that whatever they will do in relation to nutrition is about what parent is modeling so if you are not doing the right thing if you are not working your talk then please forget it your kids will not also learn anything healthy in relation to nutrition Physical activity. I want to use this opportunity to commend the past and the present management and board of KNUSC for all the systems they've put in place for preventive health. And based on the health belief model, and I know if no punitive action is attached to this, it will be there and it will be uh, very few people who are using it. So what can, uh, can management do? I think it can be attached to promotion. So the number, or you going to check your blood pressure, it should be part of your file that you turn in for your promotion. In the end, the, the university will save a lot of money for prevention than curative or manage, uh, managing any condition. So the number of times maybe you've been at the wellness center or at the UTAG uh, facility, and if I stand to be corrected, in the whole nation, uh, and mostly part of Africa, I've not been to many parts, I think KNUSD stands out in terms of preventive medicine with all these facilities that have been provided. So as, yes, please let's clap. <laughs> Uh, just last week, some, we had some people coming from UCC and U University of Allied, Allied Health Sciences. And one professor here was showing them around proud. This is what we have. This way, and it's well stopped. So I asked him, how many times have you been here? He says, I do it in the house. So, <laughs> so please, I, I think management should think about it. If nothing pushes us to be there and will use these facilities. In terms of physical activities, I won't mention so much because I think tomorrow we have more, benefit, uh, more issues, but there is a positive association between physical activity and healthy aging. Because pe some people say that muscles do not uh, know age. So far as you keep working them, they will grow and be strong for you to also live the kind of quality life that you need to have. Our living environment, you being in a rural area or urban area as we find ourselves, has its own disadvantages and advantages. The disadvantage is that we also have easy access to junk meals. So, uh, and we are very busy. We just call, I want fried rice, and it's brought to your table. But we also have access to all the healthy stuff that we can eat for good health. In terms of quantity, it's individual based. But uh, this year, Ghana launched its first food-based dietary guideline. And this is our Asanka. The Asanka, if you are to look at the portion have been created, it's almost like the Mediterranean diet that I mentioned. Almost half of the Asanka is uh, fruit and vegetables. The other quadrant is uh, whole grains and cereals, and that of the protein, majority of the pro protein portion is the legumes, nuts, and the seeds. And we have the animal protein occupying just a small bit. In fact, that is the smallest part. Oil is seen outside the asanka, so that means it has to be in a, in a quantity also because of the calories. How can we domesticate our Mediterranean diet? How can we translate this in our diet? The first is gobe. 
So with gobe, how can we make gobe Mediterranean diet? That is, if sometimes, most of the time, we will take the fish off and include vegetables with our gobe. When you mention vegetable, people are thinking of the curly flowers. The dandelion, that is a nuisance behind your, your, your house. The tomatoes, onions, they are always available. When you cut that and you add this to your gobe, you are eating Mediterranean diet. Let's see our otto. This otto we use, whether it's plantain or yam, we use granite. Granite is a vegetable protein. What about if you include the granite paste more in the otto, the, the ones that have not been grounded, and sometimes eliminate the egg? We are not becoming vegans, but we are controlling how much animal proteins we are exposed to. Then, in addition to that, we can add some vegetables as well. So, it's uh, the same author that we are eating. Our uh, gankenke. In Kumasi, I, that thing is not done in Accra, but Kumasi, they sell gankenke with okra stew and beans. If we are to add this to our meal, and we, because we are adding beans, we can reduce our fish. And this will also stand as Mediterranean diet. Our wache, high in, in, in vegetable protein. And our papransan. At first, our papransan was done with roasted corn, uh, just roasted corn that has been milled. Now, it is winemess that is being used for. And this already is mixed with soya bean and granite. So even if I don't add any fish or anything, koto, but there can be a propensa without koto. So, <laughs> so we, we, you can, a child or anyone can eat this meal alone without any animal protein, and you will still harness all the benefits that you need. Our abom, abom, we have different types. In terms of uh, food diversity, as I mentioned, the benefits. In Ampesi, we have sweet potato, which Kumasi, they call abrojoma. We have the cocoa yam, we have plantain, we have yam, we have the water yam. And these are all healthy choices that if we are to change, depending on the season, if it is in season, we make use of such foods and we will be able to get all the benefits. Now we come to our fufu. The live soup, look at all the animal protein on it. Once in a while, if you are eating this, it's fine. And know that all the oils on the fufu is saturated fat. And that's what we are supposed to replace with mono and polyunsaturated fat. The granite soup, granite itself is a vegetable protein. But I can't imagine granite soup without any animal protein. It would be nice. So we can also include some fish or the chicken if we are eating our chicken once in a while, this can be included. And we have our palm nut soup also represented. This, I would say, we can skim the oil and use that oil for our boom the next time we are cooking anything like that. Our okra stew, the omutuo TZ. TZ, with the tuo, it has been polished. The corn has been polished. But we have people doing TZ with unpolished corn. If this is done, then it also qualifies to be a Mediterranean diet because there is more ayo is the greens, and we are having whole grain, then the tomatoes and the oils also represented. You can see with the, with the omutu or the rice balls, they've still added the okro, okro, cut okro, and this is also increasing your vegetable intake. They are varying foods. Um, Personally, bringing all these things before the rice, because Ghana now all our, our food is becoming rice. But there are many options. This is even limited. When you cut across the nation, there are many options that we have. And the ingredients are always in our market that we can make use of. The foods are many. But look at the, the Gary photo. It's typically a, a, a central region food. But we can do this with maybe red beans added to it, some more vegetables to it. You can flake your mackerel, roasted mackerel in it, and it also qualifies to be a Mediterranean diet. All that we are saying is, then our last meal, I intentionally brought this porridges 
the last because we think porridge is always a breakfast meal. But we can use this as our supper and eat our kenke in the morning. There is no stray jacket because in the morning you'll be walking around, you'll be doing stuff. So if you eat much of your calorie in the morning, you are sure that you'll be able to uh, use them. The first, this first one that I place here is not rice water, it's called fonio. Fonio is a whole grain cereal gotten from the northern part of the country. It is very good for sugar control as well as for weight management. And I know most of you have not even heard about that, but it is in the market. If you cut these bananas and add to it, add your granite, you are good to go even without milk. This is our wheat porridge. This is our house cocoa, but it should not be sieved. And you will be able to qualify this as a Mediterranean diet. This is brown rice porridge, not our normal rice water. This is brown rice porridge, and it's also a healthy meal. This is the infamous uh, oats that we are munching every day because we think that's the only best food. The Tom Brown, which is also already balanced. Then we have sogum. Sogum is also there. It looks this almost like millet, but it also has its own benefits. Then our corn porridge, which we can enrich with our granites, and it will also qualify as the vegetable protein. So in conclusion, if we are to look at our meal frequency, the timing of our meals, the choices in terms of carbohydrates, protein, fats, and oils, trying to replace most of the animal protein with vegetable protein and eating those animal protein once in a while because they also have their role to play. Eating them once in a while in a moderate level as the Mediterranean diet recommends, we are sure that we will be able to make the right investment. Then all the investment and money that you've put aside, you will surely enjoy it in good quality life. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Shall we please applaud her once again? I'm sure with the presentation of food, um, many of us will realize we are corporates. So we would have to uh, change our ways. When she spoke and mentioned spring rolls and both roots and the rest, Anasha told me, ah, sister, you're so good, and I said, why? I said, well, if he says, I basket package in the baby. No, I'm saying, that's all I can say. Anyway. We are drawing close to the end of the program. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. And Mrs. Linda Bacha Debra for the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Yes. We are very grateful. And as the saying goes that gratitude is not only the greatest of all the virtues, but the parent of all the others. We'll would be very ungrateful if we don't appreciate the efforts of all who have contributed to the success of this, our program. We will firstly call on our dear Lord Almighty and say thank you for giving us the ambience and the good environment that we are in. We have the strength and the energy and the life that we have, and we cannot be ungrateful. We thank you, dear Lord. We are also very grateful to our Vice Chancellor, represented by the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Ellis O. Sudabo. We know the enormous work that you have, but you prioritize this program. 
I would say and go back and stand on existing protocols, dear chair, if you permit me to continue. <laughs> we thank the chair, we thank all registrars here in present and the deputy registrars from our great institution. We are also very grateful to the provost of the College of Health Sciences and the sister colleges who have all made it to this program. We are very grateful for, to you for being present here. We are also very appreciative of the dignitaries that have guided. We say thank you to all representatives that are here. Those representing the Minister of Ashanti, those representing the Food and Drugs Authority, the Standard, Ghana Standards Authority, those representing all the professional bodies that are here. We are grateful to all principals and representatives of the training institutions that made it to our program. We thank you so much. Our deans and directors, we cannot continue without saying thank you and appreciating your presence in our midst. Thank you so much. We have heard so much. We have to move on, either change our lifestyle or maintain our lifestyle. And this is due to all the great speakers who have spoken to us this morning. We are so grateful to you. And I think that we are really going to think about what to do next so that our lives will be better. And our theme for this, our program, will be realized. Thank you so much. The organizers of the program have done so well. I'm sure you know them at the end of everything. And so we would say thank you to them as well. The media the academic and non-academic staff, senior members and students here in present. We are so grateful unto you. And we, as the College of Health Sciences, would say thank you for coming and we hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you for the vote of thanks. I respectfully invite the chairman for his closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, a lot has been said. It's, it's my distinguished honor to say the closing remarks. I think uh, very briefly, what I'll say is that uh, we sticking to the theme uh, I've been charged this morning to promote healthy lives and our well-being. Uh, and we've heard all the talks from the director general, the director, regional director, who pointed out to us that the policies are there for us to take the needed actions to live a healthy life. The Pro Vice Chancellor shared with us the story of his bicycle. Uh, I'm not going to tell you my story, but we all have our skeletons there. Things that who has got a, uh, anyway, I'm not going to ask, all of us. So let's, let's seek to improve our, our lives. Uh, and, and of course, the provost uh, highlighted the need for us to go beyond this meeting and ensure that we translate everything that we learn into, into action. Uh, the Dr. Tano, uh, he was a very exciting young man. I could see he's a motivational speaker. So I had to be waving my, my thing to say, be, slow down, young man. Your time is almost up. Uh, but he was very good. He sort of just took us through all the things that we need to know about. The need for us to be aware of where we came from. 
uh, not only think of the inheritance, cash inheritance from our family, but be aware of the diseases we've already inherited from our families and the need for us to check and monitor our health status even as we make our way through life. And of course, the very last speaker, uh, if we are, if we are, one thing I liked about your talk is that if you, when you started with say, Mediterranean diet, I was sad. And then you broke it down and brought me down to some of my favorites, uh, which we all saw on the screen, that I can still eat them. Uh, so I think, I think uh, we, we, have, we have actually been treated to a, a fantastic morning uh, of presentations, already afternoon yet, but, and I, we look forward to even more exciting presentations in the, uh, in the, in the parallel sessions uh, where people are sharing with us the findings from the research that they've actually they've conducted. So, uh, and we, uh, of course, I have, I was joking with the provost as I came up here that I have already been thanked. So what business do I have standing here? Uh, but uh, Linda, uh, adding to your thanks, I will say thank you to all of you who have made this morning session such a success, uh, uh, including the lady who came to thank us. Thank you, Linda. Let's move. <clears throat> so, and, and all participants. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I will hand over to my MC. Thank you very much for the honor of chairing this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Shall we please observe the following acknowledgments and announcements then?
our cherished and distinguished alumni and ever supportive stakeholders of our great university, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Thank you very much for the privilege and the honor to come your way briefly with a few thoughts on the KNUST Day of Giving. This is a special day to honor, appreciate, and celebrate the hen that laid the golden eggs after 70 years of existence and global impact. On Friday, the 6th of October, 2023, we shall all show our appreciation to KNUST by making financial donations to the university towards a noble cause in an innovative online fundraising initiative that is dubbed the KNUST Day of Giving. Our target is to raise 200 million Ghana cities to build a 2,000 bed space hall of residence at KNUST to solve one of the biggest problems of our students and management, accommodation on campus for students. I am therefore calling on the magnanimity of all alumni, industry, and business partners, staff, students, and all friends of KNUST to kindly make financial donations electronically in any major currency on the KNUST Day of Giving. I am extremely pleased to announce to you that you are an automatic champion for this great and noble assignment. Please let us endeavor to rally as many people as possible to create this big supporting way to make a huge impact on this global KNUSD Day of Giving. No donation is too small. Thanks so very much and do stay blessed for deciding to give to support the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. KNUSD Day of Giving. Please do not be left out. Hashtag KNUSD Day of Giving. Thank you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, your sons and daughters here are grateful to you for how far you have brought us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the many wonderful gifts that you have blessed us with. Father, and we thank you most especially for the education that we received this morning. Father, as we bring this morning's session to a close, we beg you that you continue to be with us. Bless us with every grace that we need to continue with the rest of the activities of the day. Those of us who have to leave for one reason or the other, we pray for Jenny mercies for them. And those of us continuing here, may you help us throughout the day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much for coming in. Dignitaries, please climb up. We'll take the group photographs here. Dignitaries, all our dignitaries, the provost. Be a part of the KNUST Day of Giving, said October 2020.
Blessed is the man that walketh not in the council that he then not sitteth in the seat that is can full, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in this Lord I see I did it sunrise and sundown. The Lord is I shepherd I shall not want. He maketh I lie down in a green pasture, him leadeth I beside still water them. Come here! Well, my name Black Rasta and alumnus of the great Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. 2001 batch. We are raising 200 million Ghana cities to be able to build a new hall of residence for our beautiful university, KNU Estate. Are you coming along? Let us make history. Let's make it happen. Hashtag KNUST Day of Giving. I have donated. My name is Black Rasta. Come here! Move a fire! To donate, dial star 887 star 1350 hash or log on to knwestdayofgiven.knwest.edu.gh Donate in any major currency. Be an early donor and donate now. For more information, please call 020-110-5000 Hashtag KNUSD Day of Given Be a part of the KNUSD Day of Given said October 2023 Hi Ghana, hi everyone Hi all alumni of KNUST. My name is Nikki Samonas. I am very proud to be an alumni of KNUST. I'm also an actress and entrepreneur and of course the global ambassador for United Nations UNHCR refugees. I am here to implore you, to beseech you, to ask you to donate, to donate, to donate to the KNUST Day of Giving. Kindly donate as much as you can, like I always said, because this is for solely one purpose, to build a new hall of residence. We need a lot of students there because the school, of course, has been the best and will forever be the best when it comes to Africa and West Africa. Hashtag KNUST Day of Giving. KNUST Day of Giving. KNUST Day of Giving. Anani. To donate, dial star 887 star 1350 hash. Or log on to knwestdayofgiven.knwest.edu.gh Donate in any major currency. Be an early donor and donate now. For more information, please call 020-110-5000. Hashtag KNUSD Day of Given. Be a part of the KNUST Day of Giving, said October 2023. Hello friends, Akesa Brimpong here, musician and lecturer. I graduated from KNUST with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Communication Design in the year 2008. KNUST Day of Giving is upon us. Our alma mater is raising 200 million Ghana cities in aid of building a new hall of residence. Wherever you find yourself around the globe, you can donate in any major currency of your choice. Please head to the website now and make your donation. Hashtag KNUST Day of Giving. To donate, dial star 887 star 1350 hash or log on to knwestdayofgiven.knwest.edu.gh Donate in any major currency. Be an early donor and donate now. For more information, please call 020-110-5000. Hashtag KNUST Day of Given. Be a part of the KNUST Day of Giving. Said October 2023. Hi, my name is Kafui Day, and I'm supporting Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology to give 
200 million Ghana CDs to put up a new hall of residence. All that money is not coming from one person, all right? All of us come together and we can make it happen. Come together, give, give, give. It's the hashtag KNUST Day of Giving, 6th October, 2023. All alumni, well wishers, everybody who means well for the university, give. Hashtag KNUST Day of Giving. We can do it. To donate, dial star 887 star 